Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, my name is Wes Skeffington. I'm with AMD Xilinx, um, and we'll be talking to you today about uh, MIPI sensor system interoperation, uh, interoperability testing, and some of the debug that we've done um, with uh, MIPI relative to vision applications on a new hardware platform uh, that was launched earlier uh, this year. Um, I'm with the systems engineering team, and I want to give a moment for uh, my partner in crime here, Rao, to introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, based on your time zones. Yeah, this is Rao. I am working with AMD Xilinx for about 10 plus years. I am primarily the MIP lead uh, for the MIP IP portfolio from AMD Xilinx team. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and get, get uh, started. And what we want to uh, discuss with you today is give you first an introduction of SOM, which is a system on module. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the SOM um, market and, and market projections and where we see SOM getting picked up as really a hardware form factor and then how MIPI ties into that. Um, vision applications and uh, we really focused the initial launch of uh, our SOM product with um, you know vision in mind and so we've done a lot of work around MIPI integration within the SOM uh, form factor. And then we'll touch on some of the accelerated applications. Uh, these are really going to be FPGA uh, accelerated applications that tie in and interface with, with MIPI as a technology uh, from a in, uh, data input stream point of view. And um, then we'll talk a little bit about system level challenges and hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end. So first, I um, want to uh, define what is a system on module um, or SOM and really um, it's a concept of a hardware uh, form factor and hardware abstraction um, to that's really targeted at the embedded space um, where we've been doing most of our work uh, with SOMs. And it's kind of an alternative to single board computers or SBCs um, and being able to basically bring that hardware abstraction where those things that are really application agnostic, so really the digital components, um, uh, that are agnostic to a particular application area and peripheral set and bringing that into a repeatable form factor, report, repeatable piece of hardware that can then be plugged in to um, multiple application spaces um, with that. So our first, uh, the SOM we're talking about today is, is really the, the Korea uh, K26 and it's about a credit card sized um, module that brings together um, a uh, SOC that contains a CPU, a GPU, and an FPGA, and then brings all the digital um, support circuitry and peripherals around it. So that would include, you know, uh, all the various power supplies that are required, um, all the DDR, DDR4 um, uh, chips and, and support devices, uh, a TPM or trusted platform module, that goes into it, non-volatile memory uh, with it, and then uh, again ties that in and exposes a, a set of flexible I.O. Uh, to the user. And again, one of the ones we'll uh, be focused on today is, is the MIPI I.O. Uh, enablement. Um, ultimately, where this has come from is, is uh, users and uh, looking for greater flexibility and, and being able to customize their applications without always having to start at a chip down design. Um, and you know this aspect of, of sort of the digital um, repeatable footprint of a SOM uh, then allows the customization, you know, that happens often in the embedded space around the, the unique peripheral set uh, to be defined based on that carrier card. Um, this is a, an animation uh, that uh, shows basically kind of how things stack up and it's showing that the SOM um, uh, just PCB uh, layout um, Again, it's for the PDF slides, you won't be able to play it, but the way that that uh, shows the stack of the SOM plugging into a carrier card where like, you know, if you have uh, however many MIPI channels uh, you need to implement, if you have USB, Ethernet, those are the things then that you can define based on that carrier card. Now, from a hardware design point of view, the advantage with that is, you know, the more challenging aspects of your PCB design are all captured already in that, that SOM. And so you're ending up with typically a, a, a lighter and easier uh, PCB design in that carrier card design um, because, again, you're dealing with more of the, the peripheral um, set definition. So that's what a SOM is. Now, some of the advantages of a SOM, like you mentioned the first one already, is just uh, simplification. Um, 
on the electronics design. So if creating your own board, you can just simplify and focus just on your carrier card so you don't have to worry about complexities of, of power supply design around um, you know, these SOCs that often have to be sequenced and have very specific power supplies around them. Um, you don't have to uh, deal with the, the DDR uh, challenging layouts and, and uh, route mapping matching, um, et cetera. And so this is one where we've seen a lot of the customers um, really wanting to evolve to this point. And instead of just doing a chip down design, which has often been kind of a focus um, for a lot of the application spaces uh, in embedded to you know, being able to make use of, of SOM, which is not a new concept. It's just a um, uh, really kind of uh, Xilinx and, and uh, the work that we're doing here is kind of building up that solution stack um, overall. Um, and what we also see is uh, some of these customers in the embedded space that have that diverse set of, of I.O. also um, making use of SOM where they'll take the SOM and uh, we've got a smart camera vendor uh, or customer, I should say, that is, uh, has, makes use of the SOM but then has three unique carrier cards so that they can deal with you know, the different um, application spaces and, and customers that they serve with that. So common SOM and sort of three different personalities dictated based on those different carrier cards um, that they put in. And then lastly, it also allows those uh, software developers and application developers to get started because they're not waiting on hardware. And because there is sort of a repeatable uh, based digital system for them to tie into, there's a lot of, of reuse and really what we see is dynamic reconfiguration, you know, based on those carrier card personalities um, with it. Um, in terms of, of the market size and, and where um, we see SOM getting, you know, a lot of adoption and, and pull as a physical form factor, um, you can see sort of the pie chart on the left. Um, these are kind of broken down based on, on market segments that we've worked with. Uh, defense and aerospace um, is a, a big chunk. Medical, um, automotive, oh, I'm sorry, automotive, uh, communications, and then uh, what we call automation and control, really industrial segments um, in that. Overall, um, you know, the total TAM that the marketing team sees is around 2.3 billion and again, see that growing about 11% um, CAGR, but don't want to spend too much time on, on this slide today, but the point is that there's a lot of adoption and interest in general in the broader market for uh, this form factor. Um, I touched on this a little bit, um, which is again, the, the SOM board level um, abstraction and looking at it of a chip down design which has really kind of been the legacy in the embedded um, space, uh, where uh, really as you look at that, you know, you're looking, starting at your hardware design, um, you know, device debug, board design, system integration, and then ultimately manufacturing, you know, that board before you can deploy anything. And often if you're the application or software guy, you've got to wait for at least one iteration of that to, to progress and, and get through um, before you can really get started on target. Um, with anything. Um, with a SOM based, you know, system, you can really get a, you know, your core digital system. You may not have all your peripherals, but you can make sure that you can get your OS up, make sure you can talk to DDR um, and get, you know, initial uh, communications and infrastructure in, in place with that. And so it's really a production ready off the shelf SOC DDR configuration that, you know, users can grab drop down uh, either on a test carrier card, which could be a very simple card to, just to get rolling or on uh, some of the available carrier cards that are already in production as, as reference platforms um, with that. So that really allows us to kind of change things from you know, this device-based design uh, workflow to really we'll call module-based where you can start your system design and then system integration, which is really you know, your carrier card design and then just you know customizing within uh, the carrier card uh, I/O set that sits within uh, the uh, the carrier card definition um, with that. And some of the customers that have been working, excuse me, with this to date have you know been able to kind of accelerate their time to market by by nine months because they do not have to again start all that from scratch and design it uh, from scratch themselves um, with it. The other thing that this uh, be benefit of the application of, of a SOM brings is we see uh, the ability to really have some additional software references with the FPGA um, based pre-built configurations. What we really mean with this is because we have sort of repeatable hardware 
um, Lego block in the system that also allows us then to have um, repeatable software blocks uh, that can go and, and, and travel with that SOM uh, to an extent where with the chip down design, it is not um, really able to do that because we don't know what the DDR configuration, we don't know where the non-volatile memory is gonna sit, we don't know where you know, the security module sits. And since that's all defined by this uh, SOM form factor, that's allowed us to then create sort of uh, software building blocks that then can be more easily consumed since uh, to a certain extent, the hardware platform, the core hardware platform um, is fixed by the, the, the SOM design um, with it. And so we'll talk a little bit about how that ties in. Uh, Rao will touch on, again, where, where the MIPI ties in um, with that. And so uh, one of those example sort of software building blocks and what we call accelerated application um, is what we call um, SmartCam. And uh, that's what's outlined here in the block diagram um, below. But this is deployed on one of those dev kits, SOM-based dev kits that we call KV260. And so what that takes is the, a K26 SOM and plugs it into a KV carrier card to make the KV260 um, Vision AI starter kit. So the marketing team came up with the, the terminology and how to stitch those together. Um, but again, it's a vision-focused starter kit that has one of our SOMs um, plugged into it. Um, and then we have uh, a number of accelerated application examples that are all able to be dynamically uh, brought into that platform um, with FPGA-based acceleration um, and you know, demonstrate a number of different designs uh, and a number of different uses of uh, MIPI interfaces you know, in the context of that hardware platform with real application software examples um, with that. So what you can see in the block diagram here um, on that starter kit, we've got uh, the ability to bring in, um, you know, audio through a, a PMOD, which is a, a, a common form factor used in the embedded space for the sort of eval platforms. So um, we've got an I2S uh, PMOD module that's got an ADC and DAC for dealing with the audio um, path. Um, we have an ISA sensor um, uh, input. Uh, what we're using here is the AR1335 module, uh, which then plugs in and feeds into a non-semi AP1302 uh, ISP. This is the MIPI channel then that uh, Rao is going to talk about. Um, and then you've got uh, mass storage, and then also we can deal with uh, USB-based um, you know, camera inputs. So um, we've got the, the MIPI block uh, that feeds in. We have an, uh, the SOC also has an integrated VCU. Um, with it, so video Kodak unit. And then, you know, obviously we're working through um, a uh, ML inference uh, example here in the context of smart camera, which you can load different AI models into. But this pre-processing element is all in uh, FPGA-based acceleration. And then we have what we call our DPU, which is a deep neural network processing unit. Um, this will, uh, in Fabric, implement um, a you know, different CNN model uh, computation against it. And so you can do person detection, uh, face recognition. There's a number of models that are supported in this configuration or just by loading different uh, AI models, or I should say ML inference models um, to it. And then um, your region of, of interest selection and uh, your bounding box, you know, definition, and that can get played out um, on, you know, monitor or RTSP, RSDP uh, output, and again, the, the audio uh, output channel. So um, you can see that, you know, MIPI is a, is a big front end here for bringing data into the platform. And then you'll see that some variants of this that we're doing also extend the number of MIPI channels, um, I should say MIPI sources that can be brought in um, to it because the starter kit has a capability of bringing in uh, nine channels of, of MIPI um, on it. So um, the CREA Starter Kit Accelerated Applications, um, just diving into a little bit more of, of, sort of what I'll call the, the infrastructure, uh, the bit Lego blocks that we've put in place. One is, is the Adaptive SOM, um, really simplifies that application um, carrier card design. I think we've chatted quite a bit about that already, but the, the main thing we're trying to do with that is, is basically put the platform in the hands of the software and AI developers so they can start much sooner. 
um, with it. Um, and, you know, part of the way that we've done that is, you know, the hardware sort of core firmware. So basically everything is focused on development in, you know, the OS and not necessarily having a user go back and, and build, you know, new firmware, new boot uh, firmware, because that's really not, not, excuse me, not really necessary um, at all. Um, and then what we can do with that is, is have, you know, the software uh, and AI acceleration software stacks that those sort of developers really want to make use of. Um, and, and focus their time on as opposed to, um, you know, creating drivers or, or anything like that. Um, and then, you know, laying in the, uh, the software application on, on top of that. So kind of with the diagram on the, the right here and the persona shown on the left side of that um, is, you know, where we expect, you know, the various developers to engage and, and, and tie in. Um, with it. So as we talk about, you know, MIPI implementation, typically what we see is we've got the MIPI implementer is, is, you know, closer to the hardware. And then people that are building their applications on top of that, you know, are, you know, more in this AI developer, you know, role. Um, so to enable the KV260, again, we have the pre-built reference platforms and all those higher level abstracted APIs that then build on top of it. And then, um, again, tools for providing you know, that mapping of that development environment, such as, you know, PyTorch and what have you to the FPGA based accelerator. So that's again, all about um, using the SOM, which is to, to, to lock in basically the, the hardware definition so that we can have a scalability in terms of building those abstractions on top of it. And so with that, um, I'm gonna hand off to Rao, who's gonna get into really the details of the system level uh, challenges that we faced as we brought MIPI um, into you know that the SOM and the example applications. Hey, thank you, Wes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I uh, would like to like uh, put some more focus on the system level challenges. What we had in bringing up this hardware around MIPI. So for this presentation, we'll talk about one of the case what we resolved. Like in a particular case, we see that the image freezes on the output side, right? So uh, I'm taking the same diagram what uh, Wes talked about in uh, the previous slides, right? So here, uh, the case what we have in hand is that the image got frozen now, right? So when we look back the pipe, this pipe from the sensor till the display. So when we, when we like uh, really looked at uh, all the modules in the pipe and then we narrowed down to maybe CSI to RX where it's says that there is no output from the controller. Now, if we like break down this MIPI CSRX look deep inside, right? So it is basically consists of a phi, D5 in this case, and a corresponding controller. Now, uh, the data what we have at the first level of debug is that the controller is not sending any output, but we are receiving packets at the D5 level without errors. Right. So now, uh, so that is the data in hand. Now we'll go to the next slide to see what uh, more details we have. So we looked at uh, the sensor level scope data, uh, where we want to confirm that how the HSLP uh, patterns looks like. So those look good, but uh, the one data point here is that the sensor is in non-continuous clock mode, wherein what it means that uh, as per the MIPI, right? So once the data stops after certain clocks, the clock also can stop. That is called as a non-continuous clock mode. Uh, now that, uh, yes, that uh, sensor can operate in that fashion. That is all good. <clears throat> now coming to the controller, right? So we debugged more uh, inside the controller uh, using the tools available uh, within F FPGA world, right? So the the data what we have here is the PPI data coming out of the DeFi is not getting uh, fully processed by the controller. Now, one of the reason is that the byte clock, whatever we recover from the sensor is not sufficient enough to completely process it. Now, if you map it to the timing diagram, which is on the top right side of this slide, it actually maps to the T clock post setting. Now, combining all the data, what we have on the analysis, 
we use it some of the debug capabilities, uh, which you call it as ILA in the SOM FPGA fabric logic. And we cross compared what is the settings uh, made in the sensor for T clock post versus uh, what the IP requires. So analyzing the system behavior and the internal fabric logic for different T clock post settings. So there we could uh, came to a conclusion that increasing the T clock post is the one which will help to make the system or the entire uh, thing to resolve the, the sensor settings. So this resolved the issues wherein we were able to batch test this SOM modules completely and uh, we could able to get a clean solution. Uh, these are some of the different sensors what we have in the SOM design what was talked about AR1335, AR10144 and the RPI Raspberry Pi. So this is one of the challenge uh, which we like uh, addressed uh, based on the debug capabilities as well as looking at the global timing parameters of the uh, MIP spec. So now uh, I would like to cover a few more scenarios of what we had uh, addressed in general. Uh, one case, what we saw is that uh, on the image, we see a corruption at the bottom of the image. So that is the issue. Now, uh, what we figured out that is that the sensor is sending some user defined data. So if we see from the MEP spec point of view, along with the pixel data, there is a provision to send user defined data at the start or end of the frame. So the sensor in hand is sending this additional data at the end of the frame. And that is the reason which is also going to our display pipe and it is getting corrupted. Now, yeah, the one option could be that can we stop uh, sensor uh, doing that way? Like, uh, is there a provision to stop sending that user different data? But we see that in this particular sensor, we don't have this option. So uh, the other way, what we have had, how we have handled this is that uh, the data type is the one which will differentiate between the user different data versus the pixel data. So this we used uh, as an option to demux the pixel versus user defined data so that we don't want to pass the user defined data through the video pipe. So that resolved this particular issue. And the second one is uh, the transitions, right? So when we transitions from LP to HS, there is a particular sequence, LP11, LP01, LP00. So in this case, what happened was, uh, we are not able to detect the LP to HS transition or any basically any transition The we see that the control is always in the stop state. So for the debug tells us that the duration of LPX is not enough or is not as per the specification uh, based on the current settings of the sensor. So with that, uh, what we see is that when we try to increase the TLPX of the source. So this resolved uh, the detection, basically the LP to HS detection, and we are able to progress on this. And the last one uh, I want to explain is more uh, about this um, sync pattern detection. So in this case, what happened is that the controller is always reporting some synchronization errors. So looking at that what we found was like uh, this particular sensor in hand uh, needs some more settled time before it actually sends a constant pattern followed by a, a sync pattern right so now there is there should be a corresponding uh, parameter available at the rx level which is a receiver here which we call it as a hs settle so we don't uh, once we increase this hs settle parameter we are able to uh, mask all the errors, uh, basically mask all the uh, garbage data coming out of the sensor before actually sending the sync pattern. So this is in this particular case, this uh, increasing the HS settle resolve that issue. So with that, uh, I would like to summarize our presentation. Yes, uh, Wes talked uh, like uh, in detail about what SOM is about and how it is capturing the industry standard interfaces as well as the communication protocols. 
and how it is helping to reduce the development time. And this also facilitates the hardware designers with a greater level of abstraction uh, versus the chip down designs in the conventional way. Uh, the previous debug details, whatever we talked about is primarily like we could able to do in this FPGA world is primarily because of the debug capabilities, uh, what we have in the FPGA at domain here. And in almost all the cases, except for uh, uh, this um, uh, one of the case, what we talked about, like uh, I think three of the four cases are related to the global timing parameters of the sensor. And for to interrupt, like we may need to adjust uh, primarily around these parameters uh, for an EP based application to uh, work or to bring up a uh, MIPI sensor. Uh, that is all we have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, MIPI committee, as well as all the MIPI team members. Uh, Haran, over to you. Uh, we would like to take a few more questions. Right. Thank you for the highly uh, informative presentation, uh, Rao and Wesley, on the sensor system interop and uh, debugging solutions for vision applications using this uh, system on module uh, leveraging the MIPI uh, camera sensors, right? So our first question is, um, what are some of the advantages and, and potential benefits of, of, of the system on module solution over the existing incumbent hardware options in the in the industry. The you know key things really are about just just hardware abstraction. So I take those aspects that are, are really application agnostic and template them in the form of a, a, a module that then I can you know physically plug into different peripheral sets you know, with it. So. Um, you know, the, the advantages um, really are in terms of that hardware design abstraction, the fact that I don't have to design that from scratch myself each time. Um, and even within, you know, a given, um, you know, customer, uh, it allows them to generate, you know, various product SKUs because they can use that same SOM and then have different peripheral sets. So we have some customers that have a SOM based architecture and perhaps 20 different carrier cards because they have such a diverse set of peripheral um, physical peripherals that they need to interact with and then they can basically have have all those separate and um, and then the SOM is common and plugs into to all of them so it's all about abstraction and scalability versus chip down designs uh, right Rao I'm going to just jump to one of the uh, other follow-up questions that, that's related to this one which is are the um reference designs available today or is it still kind of work under development we actually have for the kv260 we actually have four different reference designs that are available um and uh two of them um you know make heavy use of, of mipi and the one that we walked you through specifically today is called smart camera um, another one that makes use of uh, the MIPI uh, AR0144 um, is the defect detection uh, example application. And then um, both, and then also NLP Smart Vision uses the same sensor, the AR1335 uh, that Rao touched on um, earlier. Fantastic. Our next question is, um... Can you speak about the variations and, and permutations of the system on module solutions and then perhaps their target applications on product uh, platforms? Sure. Um, so we launched, um, you know, the first SOM, what we call K26, and that number is meant to kind of represent the amount of ca hardware capability that's in it. Um, and that K26 SOM, um, is is sort of application agnostic but it kind of designs defines the size of engine you have if you will um and then we launched the kv260 um starter kit which is again that vision based you know system and then uh we recently just updated another dev kit um which focuses on robotics applications so it takes the same som brings it into um, what we call kr260 again the, that marketing um play on on you know, stitching things together to create, you know, another uh, dev kit variant 
that is focused on robotics instead of vision applications. You know, in that KR260, for example, we have ROS2 based integration, then that ties into a lot of the ROS perception, you know, um, aspects of a vision stack um, with it. And, um, and then we're actually in the middle of divining sort of the, the little brother to the K26 um, SOM. So that'll also then give scalability in terms of that size of engine, you know, because uh, whether I have power limitations, I have cost limitations, um, I have physical footprint limitations, um, you know, we're working on that next part of the product family then that will kind of give, in addition to the carrier card, scalability will also give that SOM side scalability. Um, and those have um, shared uh, pinout definitions in the same connector. So um, you can take the same carrier card and go from you know the K26 to its smaller brother um, in time. Would it be possible for system integrators to leverage SOM for temporal synchronization. So let's say the system has two or more sensors. C could some help um, uh, facilitate temporal synchronization by uh, triggering exposure on both sensors at the same time on a, on a system platform, on a complex vision system platform? You know, in theory, yes. I would say that, um, you know, one of the the reference designs which was on the kr260 that it exactly solves the temporal synchronization problem um is i'm just gonna put this here in the landing window it makes use of an ieee standard technology to do this over ethernet called time sensitive networking um, and with that we can establish very tight time synchronization between you know two remote nodes you know on the order of um you know, less than a microsecond, um, and even in hundreds of nanoseconds. Um, what we don't have, but in theory, you could do is then tie that in to, um, you know, a camera system where you're synchronizing things, as as you suggest um, in, in your question. And I just posted there in the chat sort of the TSN example application. Again, it's, it's on the KR260 platform. But in concept, yes, you could do exactly that, and that kind of shows the foundation of one of the ways um, that, uh, at least in the industrial robotics space, is solving that synchronization problem. Oh, that's that that's very interesting uh, uh, for sure, Wes. Okay, um, let's see. Perhaps um, perhaps there is time for one more question. Um, this is kind of very forward-looking, uh, Wes and Rao. Uh, based on the industry trends and your customers and, and the projections, do you envision any potential benefits of standardizing algorithms quite often used for deep neural network processing for CNN? Um, or, or do you kind of envision developments of this nature, algorithms in particular, would, would continue to remain as proprietary uh, implementation on, 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 the, on the journey ahead? I think that's the big question in the space of ML and, and AI. Um, what will it yeah. be? And I think you know what what we see so far is is that really hasn't settled out. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we see a lot of folks that want to go with the FPGA is because um, it gives that flexibility as the neural networks um, evolve, you know, over time to um, have the flexibility to deploy those and, and deal with them um, at various degrees of, of programmability. Um, I think one of the more interesting areas of, of that is as we look at, you know, the problem of ML inference is looking at the, you know, whether you want to call it, you know, um, performance or energy spent per inference, you know, as we look at um, the ability to take those ML uh, networks and look at it from a bit precision requirement point of view. Do I really need to have and maintain, you know, 32 bits at every layer of the network? Can I get by with int eight or can I get by with int four, you know, computation? And each time you look at it from that side, which helps you get through in terms of that performance um, energy, you know, versus energy uh, cost point of view, um, that's, um, you know, a way to go after it. But that then that brings in what is the standard? Well, how do I create that? And how do I retrain, you know, the, the corresponding model um, with it? So um, 
guess a long way of saying I, I don't think it's really settled out yet. Um, I don't think um, we would consider what we're doing proprietary networks because we're again we're using you know uh, networks that are, are established in the community, but then it's just addressing those questions of where can we do pruning, where can we do optimization from a bit width point of view. Um, and again, the tooling's all there to bring that into uh, the FPGA fabric. Wonderful. Wesley, Rao, thank you again for a very informative and, and a highly uh, um, uh, you know, engaging uh, uh, presentation on, um, on, on the uh, various ways in which vision is uh, expanding and specifically uh, sensor system interop and debugging solutions using system on module. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Thanks, everyone, today. Um, just wanted to do a quick wrap up. Just wanted to thank everybody for joining us uh, today. It's been a great uh, first day of DevCon. Um, big thank you to all of our sponsors, speakers, and MIPI members who made today possible, as well as our committee. And as uh, Ron said, we'll see you tomorrow at the same time, uh, 7 a.m. Pacific time. So thanks again, and we'll see you tomorrow.